Today's Lessons Learned episode is a little bit different. It is a free training I did for a podcast guest who will be airing on next week's podcast, Jody Silverman. She's doing an event next week, and so you'll hear all about it if you tune in next Tuesday to that episode. Uh, but I am not going to be available for the live event, so she asked me to pre-record a training, which I've done, and I am sharing it with you on the podcast today because I don't want you to have to go to the event if you don't want to. You can just get it right here. So I will say that I did do uh, a screen share, um, so it's a slide deck. So if I think you can get the most out of it by just listening, but there is one slide that I walk through that might be more helpful if you have a visual of it. So I would recommend you go to my YouTube channel, uh, Not Your Average Grandma, and you can catch the podcast episode there. So anyways, it's a, a training uh, and it's about the six empty nester personas that I've come up with. And at the end of the training, you can take my quiz to find out what is your persona. And in the training, you'll find out more about the persona and why it could be a problem or it might not be a problem, but you'll find out in the training. If you've already taken my uh, quiz and so you know what your persona is, you should still take the training because it is a lot more in depth, which is great. And secondly, I have another free training that I've done, which I offer at the very end on the last slide of the training and I, I speak it. So if you're listening to just the audio, you'll hear the link at the end as well. So a couple new free trainings, but this one is the first one. It's the kind of the foundation of uh, what I found to be empty nest roles that many of us play, me included. I played many of them. <laughs> I think I've, I've played uh, four out of the six or maybe even five out of the six. So listen to the training and uh, enjoy, learn something and see what clarity you might gain from the training, because I guarantee it will be eye-opening once you find out your persona. Hello, I am so excited you are here and you are ready to learn about empty nest personas. And at the end of the training, I will give you a way to find out what yours is. And I'm going to share with you why it might be a problem. So let's get started. So first, I want to cover our agenda. I want to explain who I am and how I became familiar with these personas. I have six of them I'm going to cover, and I'm going to share why knowing them is important. I'm also going to share a little neuroscience lesson because I love, learn, I've learned a lot about how the brain works and I find it fascinating and how that relates to personas and how these personas or identities impact your behavior. And of course, you'll find out your empty nest persona. So who am I? First of all, I am the mom of two daughters who are grown who I felt raising them, giving birth to them was life-changing, first of all, made me a better person, and raising them was the best job ever, ever. And I'm somebody who worked a full-time job, so it wasn't like I was a stay-at-home mom. So I'm not sure if that's you, but that was me, and I felt very uh, lost is probably the best word when they grew up, when they left home, when they didn't need me anymore. And I struggled deeply with adjusting to that empty nest life. So I realized I found myself passionless. I woke up one day thinking, I'm just not passionate about anything. Uh, and I was searching for answers, uh, questioning, a lot of questioning. I wouldn't say I searched a lot because I didn't know where to begin. So I just had these thoughts about how I wasn't truly happy, even though from the outside, I, it appeared I had a happy life. And then I felt guilty for that. But I was at the peak of a very su successful career uh, in corporate America when I could dedicate all my time to my job because I didn't have to worry about my kids. <laughs> but I was at the most unhappy point in my life, uh, which 
cause some change. So I ended up getting divorced after 25 years. Uh, I will say there it was a process. Uh, so if you have been divorced um, or are contemplating it, you've probably been in a period of time where you've had conversations, you know, things aren't working, you're trying to work it out. Uh, and that was me. So I finally decided to take the plunge. And I knew that I couldn't change unless I totally uh, branched out and figured it out. And that required me being on my own. And I also felt that my ex-husband uh, wasn't happy either. And so he, by choosing to separate, it was in a way giving him the opportunity to change as well, even though he didn't realize it at the time. And so I finally decided to take scary action and pursue the life that I now believe I was meant to live. Not that it was easy and not that I had the 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 wherewithal uh, that I have now in terms of what was going on inside my head. And now I understand it much better. But I, uh, as I was approaching my 60th birthday, so of course, as I was approaching my 50th is when I made major changes for 10 years or 13 years to be exact, I was kind of navigating, uh, understanding, finding new love, uh, looking for more purpose, uh, dabbling in some things until ultimately I realized I want to be a coach. And so I got certified and it's something, it's a yearning I had, I realized from like back when I was 18, when I wanted to be a social worker and my mother talked me out of it. So there were inklings that I always suppressed and shoved away. Um, and I got into a very successful uh and profitable, I will say, or, uh, you know, financially successful uh, career. And so there, money has a way of making you make the wrong choices in life. Sometimes your purpose isn't what is going to pay you the most money, but it's what's going to fill you up and give you the most spark uh, is what I like to, to call it as is give you the most fulfillment in your life. And uh, so sometimes uh, you, the, the, the answer, you argue yourself into, okay, this is better for me and my family because I'm going to make more money. And yes, that those are the decisions we sometimes have to make, but that doesn't mean that that is like your purpose in life. Uh, and so I realized that because when you aren't happy doing what you're doing uh, and there's another yearning, it means you haven't hit the nail on the head with, what you're supposed to be doing. So I got certified as a master neuro coach after I turned 60. And I created a program called the Second Half Spark School, where I help women over 50 find new purpose. And it's so rewarding to help somebody who is in her late 70s uh, find more fulfillment in her life when she thinks that it's not possible. So I have students who are range from age 49 to 77. Uh, and then I also created the Not Your Average Lives podcast, which I love, and I share inspirational stories. I find people who've pivoted in some way uh, their life to chase their purpose, uh, to find new purpose. Uh, and so I share those stories that pertain to the second half of life. And, and I, my goal is to inspire people with the episodes I do. So if you want to follow me, just for future reference, I am on not as I go by not your average grandma, I'm on Facebook, and YouTube as that and then on Instagram, I'm that but I have underscores in my name. So that's where you can find me if you want to get some I like to do fun reels. So if you like to be silly, then you can find me being silly. All right, so we're going to get right into the content. What role are you playing? So I've identified six different roles. And I call them personas, but you can call them roles, you can call them identities. Uh, but I know them well, because I have played them myself. Uh, not all of them, but some of them. And as I explain them, I will share with you uh, which ones kind of pertain to me, because I think real life examples help. Uh, but what I've learned is that the role we play determines the results we get in life. And you may not agree with this because many of us 
feel victim to our circumstances. However, you can change your circumstances by changing your thoughts and changing the actions behind those thoughts, hence the behavior, by stepping into new roles. And so that is what I really want to explain to you. So if you are playing a role that is is keeping you stuck, that is keeping you stifled, that is keeping you from what from happiness, then listen to the roles that you can change your results. You can change what your life, your current life is and go after what you want. So that's the really the purpose of understanding the roles and how they're affecting and impacting your life. So if you spend the majority of your time in a role where your actions are not moving you towards what will fulfill you, then how do you think you'll ever feel fulfilled? Makes sense. So I've identified two groups, the unsparked, I call them, and they take actions that aren't moving them towards fulfillment. They're either moving away from fulfillment or they're just not doing anything, not taking any actions. The sparked who take action that gives them purpose and keeps them there. It's purpose and a deep purpose is sustainable. I mean, that means that when you are there and you're doing the things that light you up, it's sustainable. It doesn't go away. But what you have to learn is just like jobs change, what's the underlying purpose to that? And so it, it's not surface. It's deep. It has to be so deep to understand what it is, the activity that you, that lights you up inside. And that's what uh, is ultimately the purpose that you're, that we are, all are looking for. Uh, so in this training, I'm going to walk you through the roles and how the roles and the behavior uh, is determining the results that you're seeing right now when you look around where you live, who you're with, who you hang out with, what you do in the morning when you get up, just how you plan, how you, how you uh, attain goals, do you set goals? So, you know, what, what um, results, what, what choices are you making that are giving you these results? So, and as I go through the roles, I'll share where I can examples to help you better understand because I, I love examples. I think they always help. So this is the chart. Here they are. I'm going to go over these in complete detail, but um, I also want to talk to you about uh, the elements of time and fulfillment because these are uh, variables that play into the different personas. So let's start at the bottom. The scared settler. And the scared settler is what I consider kind of the very lowest of low in terms of fulfillment and how they value time. So time is an element and we, we either value it or we don't value it. And we might think we value it, but the way your behavior will indicate whether you value it or not. So, and time is very important to all of us. And the older we get, the more pressured it is. It is. So it's very much a, va uh, a variable um, as it relates to the role you're playing. And then fulfillment. So I'm going to talk about each of these as it relates to the specific persona. And then, I'm, like I said, I'm going to go into more detail on the various personas. So, but a scared settler wastes time because what they usually do in terms of action and behavior is they don't go after any form of fulfillment. They don't try to find it. They, they keep talking themselves out of it more than likely. They don't take action. They stay in their comfort zone and they just keep doing what they've always done. And they uh, also uh, are very scared um, about leaving the comfort zone. And so I consider these people to be settling for the life they don't want. And they don't, they know they're not fulfilled. They know something's missing. Uh, and some of their behaviors might even be uh, in terms of wasting time, like scrolling the internet, watching negative news and that sort of thing. But the overwhelmed winger is somebody who just wings her way through life and feels very overwhelmed. So she doesn't plan her time 
and she doesn't really feel fulfilled. She's pretty low on the fulfillment. She, she just is so busy being overwhelmed. She doesn't even, you know, think about some of the deeper things that she should be thinking about. The distracted dreamer isn't really productive because she's just dreaming. She's so busy dreaming that she's not doing any acting on her dreams. So she's a little bit more fulfilled because she does have her dreams and dreams are important to have. And uh, usually uh, the other personas, many of them don't do any enough dreaming. Um, this one just happens to be too distracted dreaming uh, most of the time. And then there's the busy doer and the busy doer never has enough time. Uh, and they do not value time because they don't sit down and, and, and get serious about the, wh why, why are they, why do they not have enough time yet other people have more time <laughs> and to really trying to figure out what is causing this busy doing because there's something behind the busy doing. And that's for another training, but I'll get into that a little bit more in a later slide. So they, they are busy. So they have a little bit more sense of fulfillment, but it's not really true fulfillment. It's kind of a, a, a mis, misguided sense of fulfillment. Um, but they might, the, their busyness gives them satisfaction, but it's not getting them anywhere. It's kind of like they're running in place, kind of like running on a hamster wheel. So the organized planner is super productive and they have much more of a sense of fulfillment because they're so organized. They feel like they're, they're checking off their checklist. Uh, they've got their pretty planner, but, um, and so they, they, they feel very productive, but the problem is, is that they're not because they're, and typically uh, they aren't planning the right things. They're planning the wrong things. So they're planning things that don't satisfy their sense of purpose. It might uh, help other people. And a lot of times organized planners are nurturers. They're people who really are giving and want to help other people. Um, but at the end of the day, their cup is empty because they poured it all out on other people. So, and then there's the second half, uh, the sparked second half soul. And I've termed this person because uh, this is somebody who does exactly what she loves to do. And she makes an impact in the world, whether it's to one person or to many people. But this person, the, just the light that she shines from um, living her best life and being fulfilled uh, from a, a deeper place inside, a soul deep place, I like to say, she has a fulfillment at the top of the charts. So those are the personas. I don't know if you can relate to one of them or you think you might be one of them already, uh, but let's move on and hear more about them. So the scared settler, so she's stuck in indecision, terrified of make, making changes that would rock the boat. And this is, this was me, this, I was a scared settler for most of my forties uh, because I didn't want to rock the boat. I didn't want to make any changes that would affect other people. I didn't want to be a divorced person. I had a very negative connotation with divorce. Divorce was not a part of my family. My ex-husband's parents had never been divorced. Uh, you know, although his mother did tell me once in a ba public bathroom that she wished she was, had gotten divorced, <laughs> but by then she was, I think 60. Uh, so she never got, never addressed it, never got help. I don't even think they went to, to counseling. Uh, so that may, that's very sad. Right. And so maybe that was part of me too, when that really resonated with me, because I thought, I don't want to be her in 20 years. I don't want to be that person. And so, but this person sacrifices for others when ultimately uh, they're not being, and this is my belief, um, I ultimately made the decision to stop being scared and to stop settling because I wanted to be a role model to my children of always going after. I would want my children to go after happiness and to be, do what they want to do and be who they should be, not who I thought they should be or their spouse thought they should be or whoever thought they should be. And we spend so much of our time being and living in roles because other people, because of other people's, uh, what trying to please other people and what other people want and not what we want. And we deprive ourselves. So this might be you, this might be, you are afraid to upset anybody, upset the apple cart, as I like to say. So she lives life on other people's terms and really is letting life pass her by. She complains probably to her close friends 
that she's stuck and unhappy and she might have an inkling of something, but she always is suppressing it. It's just talk. She doesn't act on it. Uh, and often when she complains, she wants buy-in and she wants uh, her friends to get on board. So this is where you might want to find somebody who won't take that <laughs> and won't get on board with the unhappy train and will say, hey, uh, how about trying this? How about taking these uh, little steps towards change. You want somebody who you can look up to and who can encourage you uh, to be less scared and to stop settling. But she does give up very easily because of this fear. But I would like to say, and I like to tell people who come through my training, is this probably isn't you because a real scare scared settler would not take action to take a training like this. So even if you test out as a scared settler, you're in the process of moving out of this role because you are taking action that is positive. So yes, but she would have like eliminated herself as not a good fit for the training because she's not yet ready to make changes. And she also probably thinks it's not possible. And so she's just bypassed the training. Uh, yes. So the fact that you are here, I believe is absolute proof that you're ready to stop settling and that you've made a decision and a commitment to change because you're curious, you're interested, follow the curiosity. And if you're here, keep going. You're investing your time and you're treating your time as high value by being here and learning. This is growth. So a good 30 some minutes of time well spent. So the overwhelmed winger, she just loves winging her way through life. She actually feels like winging is something to be proud of. Uh, and she celebrates that she's not a planner because she likes spontaneity. She sees planning as too time consuming and structured. She feels that it kind of boxes her in. Uh, she feels it threatens her ability to be spontaneous and she really treasures spontaneity. But the truth is that lack of preparation will lead to feelings of overwhelm because it's very, very stressful. You are putting your body into a stress, uh, a, a, a stress state um, when you are operating from constant interruption, when you're constantly, uh, you have no focus. Uh, and when you have no focus, it leads to this overwhelming feeling. So she does get energized by spur of the moment activity and planning does not mean that you can't be spontaneous, but you need to plan to a certain degree uh, to get rid of that overwhelm feeling. So, but, she, and she, she's great. She's fun to be with and she's always ready to go on a, the drop of a dime on an adventure. Um, I'm a little bit of a spontaneous person, uh, and many of my students, this is actually a very high percentage of my students who are overwhelmed wingers. And that's one of the reasons why I've developed a planning system, because um, I tried many, many different planners, and I decided some of them were oh, just planning alone. The planners themselves were overwhelming. And so I just came up with a system that was super easy, something that you could do that wouldn't take a lot of time to plan. Uh, and it's been a really great, um, it was it was great for me, changed, changed my life and the way I structure my days. And I know it's helped a lot of people. So if you're an overwhelmed wing winger, uh, find a system that will work uh, for you that won't feel uh like a struggle and that you're losing your spontaneity. But she doesn't have problems with people dropping in for a visit with no advance warning. That's me. I love people just dropping in um, because her, her schedule is usually not only very flexible, but wide open. So winging it is a comfortable space for her to live in. That's her comfort zone. But what happens is if she continues to operate this way, there's no, absolutely no structure that allows for space to establish goals, to take action on goals. So you, and, and goals, and sometimes we think, and this was me when I was in the corporate world, all of my goals were work goals. I didn't have personal goals. So 
many of us have these goals that aren't even aligned with what we want personally. We haven't even looked at what we want. We haven't even taken time. It's always been about our kids. It was always about my kids. And so once I became on my own again, it was like, whoa, (laughs) I don't know what I want. I have no special talent. I have no special uh, desire to do anything. Uh, No hobby. Some people are lucky because they have hobbies. They have a love that they like that's already lighting them up. Um, So how can you do more of that? But a winger does not take the time to even look at what their personal goals are and how they align with your heart. And instead of like your brain talking you into, oh, this, you should go back to school because this would look good on your resume. That's a brain goal, not a heart goal. What do you, I mean, if it's coming from the heart, do it. But if it's coming from the heart, it's usually something very specific. Like I want to go learn about how to dig archaeological uh, findings, you know, something, something very, something that's maybe been, my husband told me that once. And that's why it came up as he said, if I had to do it again over, I think I would want to be a geologist. And I think that's what geologists do is they go on architectural digs, but he's a real estate agent. And so he's, he, and uh, that is something that people don't take the time to consider and to get, get real on to, to really investigate. So there's usually no consideration about, you know, setting goals and what state state uh, steps it takes to get to those goals. And if you're a winger, you need to start structuring time in your day to do that. So a distracted dreamer, she has desires and dreams about a better future, but is inconsistent in her quest. And she also realizes time's running out. So especially because we're talking about people in their second half of life, she knows a solution is out there, but is often frustrated because where do you start? What, is there a book? That was me. I was like, I would Google stuff. I would go to the bookstore. Uh, Now there's a lot more opportunity because the internet has opened up so many options and you can follow people who, uh, and and I would say, find somebody who you're, you're attracted to, who, you know, you like their, their personality. Uh, You, they have what you would like to have um, because that person can ultimately be a mentor and it doesn't have to be somebody, you know, it can just be somebody you follow and you like, and you connect with online. So find somebody that has the life or has reached the milestones and goals you want, and then learn how to get them yourself because it's never too late, never too late. So the distracted dreamer is not taking action. She yearns for something different than what she has, but she's just dreaming. She's daydreaming, looking out the window when she drives around uh, and lays in bed probably longer than she should, thinking about uh, what what dreams she wants, but doesn't know how to get them. She's probably created a vision board because she probably saw Oprah like I did say that's what you should do and you should put on your refrigerator and you should put on your mirror and everywhere. Uh, and she probably thinks about it a lot, but she's not taking action. She has no game plan for success and no meaningful or real meaningful goals. And like I said, you can have goals, but if they're not coming from the heart and they're not deeply aligned with who you are meant to be, then they are goals that won't be achieved because you're not motivated by them. And so her dreaming's not moving her forward. The busy doer, I know her well. This is me. Uh, And this is many of my students as well. So she is an action taker and she manages to make progress every single day. She has her to-do list. She's checking it off. Uh, So like the organized planner, she does usually have some sort of structure and has a checklist because she's so busy. She needs to constantly be looking at her checklist, right? So from the outside, it looks like she has it all together. And you probably see people like this. You probably have a neighbor or somebody you work with and it's like she has it all together, but inside she's stressing big time. Um, If she's a stay at home mom, she's likely involved in all of the things, right? With her school, uh, her kid's school Uh, might even be in charge of a committee or the PTA. Uh, If she's, and that's parent teacher association for those of us 
um, th those of you who might be in other uh, areas of the world who call those those organizations something different. If she works outside of the home, uh, she probably has a really great job and she probably is very successful in that job, has a big title and a big salary. Uh, and if you know her, you're probably like, wow, if I could only be as productive as her. And sometimes uh, that is somebody that uh, it, it's, it's a show, right? It's a show, but it, inside it, it's swirling with her. Like she's on a hamster wheel and she's about ready to break or she's about ready to have some health crisis uh, because there's a lot of stress going on in her body. She might be getting a ton of stuff done, but the things she are doing are usually nothing she wants to do. And she's a pleaser. So a lot of the things on her to-do list are, are for other people. For me as a busy doer, it was my work. So my boss, every, every, anything he wanted on my list, my staff, because at some point in my career, I became a manager and then I, I went to a director and then I went to a vice president. So, of course, I had a big responsibility and it was all about pleasing my people, my organization, pleasing my kids, everybody else, my husband, my ex-husband. So, yes. And so those things were always on her list. And she never took a step back and said, what is on my list for me? No self-care, probably routines. Too busy. You're too busy to do that. Um, but not feeling pretty much feeling miserable inside and think about it. Everybody's putting her on a pedestal thinking, Oh my gosh, she's so busy. She gets so much done yet. Here she is feeling miserable inside and they have no idea. And this is like where I was in my getting ready to leave my ex-husband is like, I kept thinking I'm miserable, but nobody thinks I am. Everybody's looking at me thinking, Oh my gosh, she's got the husband. She's got the house. She's got the cars. She's got, you know, everything. When I didn't, I, I wanted to toss it all and, and really find something that made me happy inside. It was all surface stuff. So the busy doer is doing, 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 and she gets her uh, uh, like a, a boost, you know, kind of like an adrenaline boost when she checks things off of her do list. It really does um, get her excited. But at the end of the day, those che those checks that she's checking, they're very th that adrenaline rush is short lived. It does it's not long lasting. It does not fill her cup. So it's like a little it, it's it's like a drop in the cup, which then evaporates. So she just is usually very tired. She says a lot and thinks a lot. I'm super busy. I can't do that. Or um, I don't have the time. She tells people a lot that she doesn't have time. Uh, and so th listen to those, those inner thoughts and conversation that's happening. If you think this is you, uh, and then when she's alone and she feels very unfulfilled and unsatisfied and the organized planner is somebody. And remember, she's one who has a sense of fulfillment, but she likely is not. She loves to do list, very organized, plans, plans most of her time every day. She has a to-do list or she's very, she's probably has an app on her phone too. She's very up on like whatever the latest organizational tactic is. Uh, she loves determining priorities. She is always looking and, and categorizing things in terms of priorities. This was me at one point in my career. You can be more than one persona and you can flip back and forth between personas. So some of these are, uh, and if you do take uh, the quiz and you end up with a persona, just know that that is just the one that you're, you're the most, it, it, on. Uh, if you're looking at a scale, on a scale, you're the highest in that one, but you could be very much um, close to another one. It's kind of like if you have ever taken the Myers-Briggs. So people there, it's, a, it's like a, you know, uh, introverted, extroverted. And some people are kind of in the middle. They're like ambiverts. And so you, you will test out as either or, but if you look at the details, um, they have percentages. And so you can tell if you are, are you kind of lean towards extroversion, even though you're an introvert. So anyways, um, she loves determining her priorities and shifting things around and circling what's important. And she might even do the Franklin planner style where it's like, uh, you know, they use a, B, and C. A is like, got to do today. B is, uh, would like to do today. But it, you know, C is, uh, we'll do it sometime this month. <laughs> and then you, within those categories, you put 
one, two, three, four, five. So yeah, so I did that and I learned the Franklin planning system when I worked um, in corporate. And so that, yeah, shifting priorities, that becomes a real big focus. Shifting around, you spend a lot of time shifting your priorities when maybe you should have less priorities and be focused on the doing and the, and the work that means something to you. Yeah. She likes Michael's because if you've ever been there, <laughs> they have a lot of, uh, uh, office products. Uh, and Oh, so does, um, what's the other one? It's, it's, uh, home goods has a really good aisle for planners, but yeah, she also probably is an event planner because she loves planning for her household. Um, but she gets sucked into creating lists and then that's all she's doing. She's not doing the right things, the important things. She's not working on setting real goals that are meaningful goals. Uh, and she's spending too much time planning and prioritizing, but not enough doing. So while she has a lot of items on her to-do list, at the end of the day, it is a didn't do list. Or maybe you do all the, the really quick and easy things, but the big things, the big rocks that need to get done, as they call them sometimes, the big rocks that will take you a big step towards your goal, uh, those are the things that aren't be getting done and they keep getting shoved to the side and carried over the next day. So none of her tasks, typically the organized planner is disconnected from what her long-term dreams are, is disconnected to those heart touching goals, to those heart, you know, those soul deep desires. Uh, and she probably doesn't have any idea what she wants, probably hasn't done a vision board. Um, but yeah, or if she has, it's, it's, yeah, she needs to, she just wants to always go back to her planner. That's kind of because, and her planner looks really pretty and she probably has really good penmanship too. <laughs> so yeah. Um, so let's talk about the spark second half soul. So I've identified two types of second half souls, spark second half souls. So I'm going to go over those. Uh, so the first one is what I call a passionate achiever. And the second one is what I call a difference maker. Um, but in both cases, this person is highly energetic, highly productive, and deeply fulfilled. And it emanates from her. You have probably been around these people and you can feel their positive energy, their, their vibe. Um, she knows how to dream big dreams and go after them. She knows how to effectively plan. So she's not getting overwhelmed and she focuses on the right things. She's not busy doing the things that aren't lighting her up. And she knows what tasks, what is the next step to take that will move her forward on her goals. She's also very confident and clear and feels like she's in control of her life and her future. And she's not so much worried about the future. She's just so excited about her day-to-day -day and what she's doing. Um, and she knows that it's only her who can decide. It's only her that can make herself happy. No one else can do that for her. So she's kind of un started to understand what fills her cup. Um, and she's learned to value her time in that respect. And she understands that she must put in the work required to actually find that true fulfillment. And she most likely has already done that work, but she knows that she needs, it's a continual process, right? Because once you hit a goal, you need to set new goals. But she's sparked about the activities she pursues because she feels they have purpose. They have purpose and they have meaning. And because of that, she is driven to achieve and it feels effortless. And just think about this. If, if you are an empty nester, did your kids give you purpose? Did you feel like they gave you purpose? So you want something that makes you feel purposeful. That's what we need in our life. And now that our kids are gone, we need to replace that with something else. And that's why I found coaching so rewarding. I just needed a new set of souls <laughs> to guide and to give advice to. Uh, so those are, those are, my kids are gone, but uh, I have, I have new children, uh, even though they, some of them are older than me. Okay. So while the passion achiever does make a difference in the world, 
through the ripple effect generated by the pursuit of our passion-filled purpose, the difference maker embarks on a much greater mission where her ripple effect goes far and wide. So you can be a passionate achiever. And I wanted to make this distinction. I thought it was really important because some people, when I give this presentation and I talk about Spark Second Half Souls, some of them think, oh my gosh, a difference maker? I can't do that. I mean, I, 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 that, first of all, a lot of people think that's really scary. You mean I've got to go out there and make a big impact in the world? It doesn't matter how big your impact is. You just have to feel like you're making an impact. You have to feel like you are bringing value to the world. And a passionate achiever to me is it, it, it reduces the scariness. And some people actually get to the passionate achiever and then they get the confidence and they move on to a different make difference maker. But you don't have to feel like you may need to make some huge mission in the world. Um, you can make a very, very small impact on just a few little souls. And it can be direct or indirect. And I talk about this more in a different training, but there's basically some people who there what lights them up is working on something that affects people but it might be indirect. In other words, you might be working in a lab and you're looking at results. Maybe you're a forensic psychologist of some sort. And we watch that show, Forensic Files. And so you're actually looking at through a microscope and what your work does is helps find a killer. I mean, that's just an example, um, but it's, it's indirect. You're not directly working with people. And then there's the people who want to work directly with people where, you know, you want to maybe a teacher, or you want to have a group of students that you teach um, or you, you know, you want an, an author is kind of an indirect, right? Cause the reader, you know, isn't right there with them, but a direct is more like your hands on more like a coach type of thing. But you, but passion achiever is, 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 a, a smaller think, just think of about it. Just, you just want to be happy. You want to do your work and you want to make a difference. Whereas difference maker, you want to make a big difference. You want to get out there. You want to speak on stage. You want to, you know, I would say a difference maker would be somebody who would write a, like a best selling book, um, like Mel Robbins, who I love. So difference makers often feel compelled to create platforms for change, start movements and change the status quo way of thinking. Their um, thought preneurs, as some people say, um, influencers, you know, they, they really want to make you think when you listen to a, a speech or, um, you see a video by them, it makes you think, it makes you stop and think differently. And that's really kind of what a difference maker does. And then they see a need for their expertise and they usually will come up with a solution. So I feel like I started as a passionate achiever because I wanted to help people. I became a beach body coach. I was I just kind of stumbled into that, but it gave me a lot of satisfaction. Um, I, and I, cause I got healthy. I got in the best shape of my life at age, age 55. And so there was an opportunity for me to be a coach. And so all I had to do is just help people do what I did. So the programs were already there. Um, I just explained my story and they would come on board and I'd create a Facebook group and we would, you know, work. I'd, I'd help them. I'd answer questions about the workout because I would have done it already. So it was for me, it was just like I was a passionate achiever because I was doing something that I loved and I was helping a very small group of people. Um, but it made such a huge difference to me and it made a huge difference to them. A lot of them had life changing transformations. But then as I was doing it, I was like, oh, my gosh. There's more here than just health and fitness. I want to help not only the physical self, I want to help the mental self. And then that kind of was the stepping stone that led me to what I believe was more of a difference maker uh, role where I wanted to step into something that I made people think of change. I changed the way they were thinking. And I I wanted to learn more about neuroscience and how the brain worked. So, so I basically was, it was, I'm a very good example of somebody who kind of like was too, that, that difference maker. Oh, that's not me. You know, we always, you know, we, our brain tends to go with what's comfortable and what our past experience will tell us we can do. 
it doesn't ever go to, I've never done that before and I know I can do it. And I think that's especially true for women. Maybe not so much for men, but uh, men fake it, I think, till they make it much better than women do. So anyways, but difference makers um, are somebody who has wants their message to spread to a larger number of people and might not have started that way, but they, as they start to journey on and become more sparked, they get more clarity and the deeper mission becomes revealed to them. And sometimes they're just not there yet. And, but as you become more sparked and you start to do the things that sparked people do, you start to get downloads uh, from your higher self. And that's another advanced training, but your higher self, uh, which busy doers are very blocked. A lot of these roles, the unsparked roles are very blocked from their inner self because the things they are doing keeps them blocked from their inner self. But anyways, both of these people are doing work in the world that lights them up at a soul deep level. And they've achieved a feeling of confidence that they never knew existed inside of them. Cause you're, as you're doing and as you're learning and as you're growing and as you're helping, it's just a co- big confidence booster. And just to be clear, because I think some people misunderstand that, um, they're in a job that sucks. So I can't do what I really want to do. Uh, so I'm stuck. Right. And then they just leave it at that, but you can do side gigs. You can volunteer. Uh, we don't have kids anymore. (laughs) So, I mean, some of us have sick parents. And so I know that's another struggle, but I will say carve out the time. Uh, we did a lot as, as working moms, if you are a working mom like me, and even as a stay at home mom, I mean, there, there was a, a zillion things that I'm sure were on your plate that you had to get done during the day. I look at my two grown daughters who have children now and I think, oh my gosh, I don't know how they do it. I have a lot more time in my day because I don't have kids than they do. And so why not have, if you have a job that you aren't lit up about, then start working towards in your spare time, finding what, what lights you up and then maybe work that in as a side gig like I did with my Beachbody coaching, which led me and made me aligned with what I believe I was meant to do and got me clarity on where I was supposed to go next. And so start to do that work. And then ultimately you might get paid for it, but maybe you don't care. I have some students who have a retirement income and they just want to be sparked and they don't, they don't need to find a job that they don't need to monetize their spark, put it that way. And you should, that shouldn't not be an element, remove money from the picture. And I I always tell my students act as if you had all the money in the world. And I know this is hard for some people, but that releases your, that your, your brain is always going to want to fear and say, Oh, you can't do that because that doesn't pay, or you can't do that because that's going to cost too much money, or you're going to get, first you need to figure out what you would do if you could do. And then you can worry about how to do that after the fact, but don't block it because you're coming from a financial uh, limitation perspective. All right. So what identity do you choose um, the unsparked, I call them the use, uh, never having fully utici- utilized or exploited one's abilities or character. So that's unfulfilled. You're not happy or satisfied because you haven't achieved your full potential. That's what it, it is. There's a full potential inside of you that is untapped and it comes from a desire. So you've got to match desire. And when you match desire with what you do every day, that's when you reach your full potential. And it's also uh, not carried out or done. It's undone, not yet achieved. Purpose-filled are the P's, the sparked. So the unsparked are the unfulfilled and the sparked are the purpose-filled. So the purpose-filled are satisfied or happy, I would like to say, and happy because of they've fully developed their abilities or character. And again, I should probably edit the slide because I, I believe it's one's abilities and character because care you're built, you're born with character traits. I've learned this in my personality uh, education, personality typing education. I've been mentored by a personality expert in reading people. And so 
you're born, you're, you have an inborn personality. And a lot of these roles, these personas that I've gone over, they're really masks that you're wearing. And so um, you're born with an inborn personality that has character traits. And those character traits will, uh, once you understand them and know what they are, they, uh, there are certain abilities that come natural, more natural to you. And so knowing your character traits and, and what, what your desires are um, allows you to get, provides insight in, in what your true abilities are. We might have skill sets. Like I'm a hell of a project manager because I learned that. I, that's what I did for, my, for, for a living. Um, and so that I have great abilities in like putting together a project plan, but that's not, that doesn't necessarily align with my character traits. My, and what my, when I did the personality typing, what I learned about my character traits is that I would make a damn good coach or trainer. And isn't that funny? Here I am. No wonder it lights me up. It was, it's part of my inborn personality and character traits. So you have to understand that. When you're fulfilled or purpose-filled, because purpose-filled is fulfilled, you feel that your abilities and talents are being fully used. So, and again, I just want to stress, don't mistake your abilities for your skill set because they can be, they, they can be the same, but they can be different. So skills aren't necessarily what, what you're gifted to do, what comes naturally to you. And a lot of us haven't even tapped into our talents. Uh, and one of our talents, from my perspective, is our wisdom. We have a lot of wisdom from the life that we've lived. And our lived experiences are important to people, and we should share them. They wouldn't have been lived if they weren't meant to be uh, shared and, uh, and uh, given as, as lessons to other people, uh, even though sometimes they don't take your advice like my kids <laughs> <laughs> they always tell me after the fact, oh, by the way, you you were right. I should have listened to you. Um, but yeah, purpose-filled also, uh, people feel happy and satisfied. Overall, they just have this deep sense of happiness and satisfaction. Okay, quick little neuroscience lesson. Um, we, we have 16 slides, so just two more after this, and then we're done. So where do your feelings come from? So I want to talk about this because every persona has certain feelings that are associated with it that are common. So I want to show you, this is exactly how, how the mind works. Okay. Uh, and I learned this in my uh, coaching certification. So this is factual scientific stuff. So you have beliefs that you carry with you that can't come from, we, our beliefs are formed at a very young age before we were in teenagers. So our beliefs come from usually family, but people who were very, uh, it could have been a teacher that was very significant in your life or some kind of a mentor or a coach, um, siblings, um, clearly parents, uh, obviously, uh, grandparents, if they were uh, in your life uh, a lot. Um, so yeah, so these the, your thoughts come from the beliefs, right? When you think something, it's always coming from a belief that like when somebody says something, you're, you're always like, it, you're, it's, there's this automated thing going on where it checks in with, oh, well, how do I feel about that? You know, and these are automated. So we'll get into that in a second. But these thoughts, when you have thoughts, they cause feelings, right? If you have an angry thought, you feel mad. Uh, if you have a sad thought, you, you feel, you cry, right? Sometimes. Uh, if you have a really happy thought, you feel good, right? So your thoughts drive your feelings. Your feelings drive your behavior or the actions you take or non-actions. So like, you know, typically somebody feels sad, they, they cry or they, they, they just lay on the couch. They don't have much motivation. Um, so you can see how actions come from how you feel. When you're happy, you want to get go, let's go do something. Uh, yeah, so that's definitely uh, where kind of the stream, how the stream follows, how it flows. And then how you behave is how you get the results in your life. 
So as you can see from this little simple chart uh, showing the flow, that your beliefs affect your results. It's as simple as that. So if we don't have the results we want, there must be something in our belief system that needs to be modified. And can it be modified? How do we do that? How do we go from one of the unsparked roles or personas to one that is sparked? So just to reiterate, behavior, I said this at the beginning, your behavior stems from your beliefs and your beliefs align with your identity because all of these identities have certain behaviors. And many, and, and, and like I said, behavior come from your beliefs. So uh, our beliefs are, are different, but there's some parallels in how they show up as behavior and identity. All right. And there are some common beliefs among the people who are in their second half of life. Uh, so, yeah. So that's what I help people do is identify what their rooted beliefs are and how to get those rewired. So understanding where your beliefs, what your beliefs are, where they come from and being aware of them, catching them when they, when they, they trigger certain behavior and how they, ab they absolutely control your thinking will change everything. Just, just getting like, first of all, understanding this from a scientific standpoint and knowing this is how it works. And then catching what they are, becoming a master at analyzing your thoughts, being aware of your thoughts, and then questioning the belief behind them. But the other real important point is that we all have to come to terms if we want to move out of the place we aren't happy in to a place we want to be happy in. We have to come to terms with the fact that our beliefs are not facts, that our beliefs, and if you notice, the word lie is in beliefs. And our beliefs are our perspective. And we argue for our beliefs. We stand firm in our beliefs. But our beliefs, if they aren't serving us, if they are creating thoughts that aren't serving us, then wouldn't you want to rewire those, those thoughts and then thereby change those beliefs? Those, that belief system to a new belief system that will work for you and serve you. So that's, that's what we can do here. So neuroscience proves that 95, 90 to 95% of our thoughts are on uh, automation driven by our subconscious mind. But the good news is that these thoughts can be permanently altered. And so just to quickly touch on this, I don't know if you ever watched Dr. Phil, but he used to say this thing to people that those are the tapes that are playing over and over in your head. And we could see it as the audience would be like, oh, I know they just they're they're just so stuck in their own thoughts. They they can't think differently. And so some of these people were so like into their own problems and they couldn't see out. They couldn't see their way out. But it was because they had these thoughts that had been imprinted in their brain at a very young age. I mean, and if you're if we're talking Dr. Phil, sometimes it was like they had an alcoholic parent and that, that was that was ingrained in their brain. And so, of course, they that's why we repeat parental be behavior. We have these imprints and then uh, they create our belief system. And so they can be rewired. Your, your beliefs can be rewired, um, but our brain stores so much and does and processes stuff automatically because there's too much information coming to us every day. Um, that familiar stuff is automatically processed. And then unfamiliar stuff that maybe isn't is like, okay, that's the 5% that we really have to like analytically, you know, figure out. But um, yeah, so just from a very simplistic without getting into the brain and showing a picture and what parts of the brain do what, just know that and what's important to know is that your thoughts, most of your thoughts 
that you think every day are on automation and we aren't even aware of them and we react every day with feelings on these thoughts and the root of these thoughts are your beliefs and it's called the rewiring of your thoughts to serve you which ultimately changes the, that belief system is called neuroplasty so you can rewire your brain to serve you and so that's cool right so a, i'm just going to give you a quick rewiring example and what a thought would be okay and i call them automated negative thoughts ants so i like to have that little uh you know description it's fun it's a fun little acronym um, but an example of something that won't serve you, a busy doer, there's not enough time in the day to do what I need to do. I mean, this doesn't even have to apply to second half people, people who are uh, midlife or older. This has to do with everybody because bu there's busy doers all over the place. Uh, and so there's not enough time. That's a thought that comes up. So oftentimes we think this and we don't even analyze it. We don't, but, you know, it's just processing. We just react. There's not enough time in the day. So, okay, I can't do that. Or, and we just make decisions and we feel usually stressed as a result of that. Right. And then it, the behavior it causes is probably, I'm not going to do that because it, it takes too much time or, oh my God, what am I going to do differently? And so it's just, yeah. And the results are, you're not doing the thing you should be doing. You're not doing the right things. You're not doing the things that will light you up. Right. So what you have to do when you is this have this awareness, what are my thoughts? First of all, what are my thoughts? Oh, I thought that thought that wasn't very serving to me. And then you have to test the real truth behind that thought, because like I said, our our belief system are actually lies. So the thought that we're getting is is really not a fact. Right. So we want to test the real truth. You kind of become either a detective or a lawyer, whatever uh, person you like to be, whatever you want to call that observer part of your brain um, that is actually like looking for the lie or looking for the exception. You want to look for the exception and then see what could be underlying um, the belief that is underlying that thought. So the first question might come you want to ask is, does everyone have the same 24 hours? Well, yeah. And are you in control of your time? Well, yeah, you think you're not, but you are. I actually had a student and it was so interesting because she was choosing the belief that she didn't have control of her time because her husband was ill. She had a very busy job and she had a mother who was sick, who was, I'm not sure she was, I can't remember if she was living with them or, but just required a lot of her time. So she basically saw that she, she really didn't have any time. She does not have any time. She doesn't have enough time in the day to do what she needs to do. But yes, she knew that everyone has the same 24 hours and that other people did manage what she was managing and managed to do it without the negative thoughts. And so that was an exception. And, and then, you know, are you really in control of your time? What are your options? And so our brain always wants to go with, there are no options. There are no options. But if you just allowed your, if you just left it with, there are options and let me, let it come to me. I am open to options. What will happen, and it might not be immediate, but over the course of a day or two, other options will come to you. It's kind of like, I remember my coach said to me when I wanted to quit my job, I said, oh, I just, I, I'm scared. I don't want to quit my job. I'm worried about losing my salary. And well, you know, I don't know. And he said, well, is it either or? Is it only like quit my job or not quit my job? Could you like, how about go part-time? How about take a leave of absence? How about, you know, what are the other options? So could you work from home? What, what, do, what do you want to do, right? What would be your desire to do? And then let your brain or let your higher self the universe, God, whatever you believe is that thing outside of you that is helping you because there is something out there helping us and you will get guidance. You will get guidance if you put your desire out there and then you're open to receiving any kind of download, any kind of uh, idea uh, and just have some time whether it's in the shower or driving in your car to just let your brain be on idle 
and you, things will come to you. Don't overload it with a news channel. Don't overload it with radio music. Let you let just silence and let your thoughts be your thoughts. And, and you will start to realize that this is just a belief that is keeping you stuck and it's not a true uh, ser- something that'll serve you. So what can you change about your current schedule? Ask that question. Don't push for answers. Just ask that question and be open to receive. And what I will say <laughs> I did with my job to finish that topic is I went on a leave of absence and ultimately quit that job that I was very miserable in. And believe it or not, my student who thought she had no options and she was very stuck in that, she ultimately took a leave of absence and was much happier as a result and made herself a priority in figuring it out. What would light her up? Because certainly her life, that she, her, the results she was getting was not the life she desired and was not the life she was deserving of. So what are your current behaviors? What are the thoughts? Start to be aware of what those thoughts are. And, and how does that, you know, will relate back to the identity in some way, more than likely. And then in this particular example, do you plan? So if you don't think there's enough time in the day to do what you need to do, are you structuring the time in your day? I know that the more structured I am, it gives me a sense of more time. Obviously, it doesn't give me more than 24 hours, but I get a sense of having more time. So do you plan? And if you don't, are you resistant to it? And if so, what are your beliefs about planning? Do you have an underlying belief that planning will tie you down, that planning will erase any opportunity for spontaneity or adventure in your life? So what, get to the root of what the beliefs are about planning. And there might even be a deeper, deeper belief because ultimately it could be about being busy makes you feel more valued. Maybe because you're busy, you're feeling these people looking up to you because like I said, busy doers, a lot of people are like, oh my gosh, she's so great. She gets so much done. So maybe there's something to do with the sense of value you get and why are you, why are you needing that validation? What happened? Think back to childhood. There could have been parents that were busy doers, could have been something that you weren't getting maybe the time you needed with someone. So you started to do things so they would recognize what you were doing. So that created, oh, I need to do more. I do need to do more because they'll be happy. They'll be happy. So just really open up that, look under that rock, (laughs) you know, open up that can of worms and look inside. It'll teach you a lot. So what if you could reverse that thought by turning it into a positive, empowering thought, which I call a pet, and then you could alter the underlying untrue belief by affirming the pet repeatedly. And that's the rewiring process that happens. And I've created a whole system around how you do that, that I teach my students. So that is the neuroplasty at work. When you take a negative thought, you turn it into a positive thought with a specific language pattern and structure, and then you repeat it over and over and over again for a number of days. And so this could be the pet that erases that ant. And in so doing, a new belief begins to form. And so it would be, I am more productive and happy because I am organizing my time in my day to make the things that are most important to me a priority. And I go into more detail in this in a training, another free training I have. So I'm going to stop here and just end this training because I think I've gone over my time. But the next steps for you would be two things. First of all, If you have not taken my empty nester quiz, please do uh, find out what your persona is and you can go. I have a special link for you uh, who are attending this training, uh, Jody's training. Uh, So it's uh, www. It's it's, just go to notyouraveragegrandma.com slash R C H. Okay. And then I think that stands for resilient, confident, and happy. 
All right. And then uh, if you have taken my quiz, because we've had <clears throat> the quiz running for a while. So you might be somebody who's already taken it and you know your persona. And if that is you, I've done a brand new free training called From Stuck to Sparked. And in that training, you'll learn the three reasons you may feel stuck as you try to navigate this empty nest phase of life. And uh, um, I think it's definitely something that uh, you should move on to. Is this, think of this as the first baby step. And then this is your next step. And you will get more clarity the more you learn. And so this uh, link is notyouraveragegrandma.com slash stuck. And so that's where you can find that training. So thanks for being here till the end. And I appreciate you. And thank you so much. I hope you got a lot out of this training. Thank you so much for tuning into the Not Your Average Lives podcast. If you haven't yet, make sure to subscribe on iTunes if you have an Apple device. You can find free resources and learn what else I have going on at the moment that might interest you on my website at notyouraveragegrandma.com. You can also find me on Instagram or Facebook at Not Your Average Grandma. If you liked this episode, it would make my heart so happy if you could leave me a five-star rating. You can also add a review to let me know what you like about this podcast, which will help spread the word about it to others who need a little midlife inspiration. As always, be you, listen to your inner voice, and focus on reigniting that lost spark so you can start living your own, not your average life. Thank you.